Uh, hello. So uh, last time uh, we were talking, uh, we were actually, go back if I can, a slide, finishing up a little piece on why intrinsic viscosity, the ability to add viscosity on a per unit basis, per unit mass basis, is not the same as viscosity itself. So that's kind of where we were. And uh, before that, uh, we got into this by talking about gels. And um, I want to tell you now just a little teeny bit about permanent gels. The gels that we used before, the only gel that we described was what's called a reversible gel. It was made of gelatin. You just take the solid gelatin, add it to water, heat it up till it dissolves, and undoes that collagen triple helix, and then cool it back down. And the triple helix would like to reform, but it can't do that uniformly and well, so it makes little crossings. But if you heat it up again, it will melt. And if you've ever had jello on a hot day, um, you'll see that it melts. And so I guess that's why it's a lot less popular down here in Louisiana than it is on the other end of the Mississippi River up in Minnesota. Well, uh, I want to talk a little bit about permanent gel networks. And we'll use as an example styrene divinyl benzene. And then uh, I'll sketch that out because I had a question about uh, you know pushing electrons. And uh, I think there's probably some confusion about that. It's um, not as hard as it seems. It just takes practice, and it's you know it's kind of a transient thing for us here in this course. So don't worry about it too much. And then we'll talk a little bit about epoxies. Okay. So uh, by now, you know that this guy is styrene monomer. And if I take n of those styrene monomers, n of those and add an initiator, which I'll write as R, I, well, I think we passed, we wrote it as I dot, right, I dot, um, I will get uh, polystyrene. Uh, with the initiator kind of attached at one end. I'll draw some of these. I'm going to leave some blank. Okay. I'll leave one blank. I guess exactly one is how many I'll leave blank. Um, if I uh, add in something else, some other vinyl polymer here, let's say R, okay, then I would wind up with R there, okay, in that bond. Uh, what I want to do is specify a particular R that we could add. I'll give it a different color. So we're adding a little bit of this, you know. Not, not, not a lot, just a little bit. Um, let's make it look like it's styrene only. Go across the ring and add another double bond at the end. This is divinyl benzene. Good heavens. I'm not sure I'm ever going to learn to write with this um, stylus very well. OK, so dye vinyl. Anything that contains that is a vinyl. And uh, this is a benzene with two of those vinyls on it. So let's go ahead and put that guy in there. He's going to be, uh, you know, here we'll make this be his uh, bond. And we'll color him blue. And uh, we'll put uh, one of those benzene rings there. OK. Now, uh, that is something that you could react to. You could have another chain growing. Remember, you have many of these chains growing at one time. So another, let's get a, let's 
Let's get another uh, chain up here. Let's uh, draw another red chain. That'll be red. Red, I said. Be nice. Okay. So we'll have another red chain. This is, you know, the same thing. Another initiated chain uh, with some things on it. And remember, the way this works is that you have a free radical at the end of this growing. I should have put that one there when I did it. So this one has the same things going on it, you know. Usually it's benzene, but it could have a, uh, a divinyl benzene on it too. We won't draw that now. So that um, can attack through there. Okay, I can make this bond through there and um, put a radical there. And so now these radicals, these just keep growing, and I'm not going to draw all the benzene rings. It just gets tedious. Okay, so this just keeps going and making a chain, and they're kind of floppy. And uh, this one makes a chain, and it's kind of floppy. And, uh, you know, along somewhere along here is uh, another one of those divinyl groups hanging out. And let's have this guy uh, flop over here and attack that and keep on going. So in the end, you wind up with, you can wind up with something that has kind of a floppy, typical floppy polymer character to it and a lot of cross links just like you had in gelatin. But the difference is that these crosslinks are covalent. Okay. So uh, this here, one here, I'll leave that uncrosslinked. That is one chain crossing over the other. Okay. And uh, here's another one. They just cross there. Okay, so all that's still going on. So it, it, it also acquires the characteristics of a gel. And uh, in order for it to be um, a real gel, uh, it should have um, occurred in solvent. So, uh, you know, just like we did for the uh, gelatin gel, we'll put in solvent molecules, but for gelatin, we put in water molecules. Water is not the solvent for this situation. That would not work. So, you know, these little dots equals solvent. And good choices for this would probably be uh, something like that. This is toluene. And remember, by our rules, I could indicate that to be, I could just do that. That would also be toluene. <clears throat> so if I put the CH3 out there on the right, it's definitely there. And if I don't put it there, it's also there. That's just our rules of drawing these uh, skeleton structures. So that's a styrene divinyl benzene gel, and that's really common. That's actually done, and it's a way to make uh, a system. If you did that without the solvent, you would wind up with a mat. If you did it in the gel, in the with the solvent, and then pulled the solvent out, you should just let it evaporate, go out. You would also wind up with some sort of solid that was crosslinked. Okay. <clears throat> now this is a different situation here. Uh, this is a situation of. Uh, 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 epoxy glue. Basically, if you ever glued anything with epoxy, you did something like this. And uh, the, the key here is to first form this sort of linear polymer. Um, and that's easy to do because this little beast here, this is the epoxy group. Epoxy. Okay. And that's a strained ring system. Okay. I have a, a carbon here. I'll put a carbon in there explicitly. Uh, there is a hydrogen there somewhere. 
there's a carbon here, and there's a hydrogen there, so I'll make these a little bigger so you can see. There's a hydrogen there and a hydrogen there. And uh, the problem for this poor carbon is that uh, it doesn't have, it has this uh, really shallow, acute, acute is the word, acute bond angle, carbon-carbon-oxygen bond, the CCO bond. Looks to be on the order of 60 degrees. This is a very, it's a very unhappy carbon. Okay? It doesn't want to have that shallow bond angle. Those electrons in the carbon, oxygen, and carbon carbon bonds are way too close. They don't want to be that close. Okay? So this thing is like a it's like a spring-loaded action. It's almost like a mouse trap. Anything comes along, it's going to spring open. So along comes, um, you know, this molecule here with these. hydroxyl groups on it and they'll spring that baby open and you'll build this 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 uh, longer molecule here and then that can continue you see you still have on either end first of all it can happen on either end and uh, it can continue reacting on either end all right and so that makes you the sort of linear precursor and then what you do is you add in this stuff uh, this an amino group that adds in here kind of forgotten the name, but I think its name is Tata. <laughs> so anyway, um, and it'll come in and react different chains to each other and cross-link that way. So this is how epoxy glues make, how you make epoxy glue in a, in a two-part epoxy type system. And there's an enormous chemistry for this. Um, by varying the R groups here, uh, you can make uh, epoxies that have more flexibility, less flexibility. You can have brittle epoxy. You can have a sort of a soft epoxy. I used to work with a guy. He wasn't a chemist. I think he was a business major. Uh, but he hired chemists. <clears throat> and his deal was to make kind of a rubbery type of epoxy. And uh, they were actually going to put that in, in between tar strips, um, like the tar strip that you have on a highway, only they were going to do it on a levee to keep the levees from leaking. That was his plan. All right, so <clears throat> um, just a word now about thermoplastics and thermosets. This is another uh, big categorization of polymers. Another way to classify them is thermoplastic or thermosets. And uh, the big distinction um, is that uh, when you heat it, it flows. Uh, if it doesn't decompose first. Um, thermostat, uh, same thing, it uh, actually heat the chemicals to set it up into a solid. Okay, so epoxy glue is that way. Styrene monomer. Uh, styrene polymer is a thermoplastic. If you take polystyrene and just heat it, it will melt, okay, uh, before it decomposes, but, uh, but it will at first melt. <coughs> But the monomer, as we talked about, I think, uh, the monomer, um, it's a liquid, and it sets into a solid, and that solid is a thermoplastic. So the monomer is a thermoset, the resulting polymer is a thermoplastic. Kind of confusing. Um, historically, these are of enormous importance, historically, because this is the original synthetic polymer, so this was Bakelite. Okay? And Bakelite... Uh, I, mean, I, I ate off this stuff every day in school lunches in the 1950s until, I don't know, they still be eating on this stuff, and it's probably the, still the same plate because it's pretty rugged stuff. Okay? And uh, in general, uh, what you have here, these are phenylformaldehyde resins. And we're not going to talk about um, that chemistry. It's a kind of complicated and fun thing to watch. Uh, I just came across this uh, YouTube earlier this morning. Uh, it's hilarious, especially at a fast speed. <laughs> the sound of it at a fast speed is, is kind of amazing. Um, but what you do is you take a formaldehyde and phenol acid catalyze it or base catalyze it. 
<clears throat> either way works. And you throw in something, you know, talcum powder, bits of fiber, whatever you have uh, as filler. A lot of plastic materials contain filler. And, um, you know, you throw in some green stuff if you want it to be green, but that green's going to be trapped in there forever. It's not a painted green, it's in there, okay? And uh, here's a, there's a filler here for uh, <clears throat> this uh, classic radio that kind of gives it sort of a burled walnut look type to it. Uh, this stuff is stable like heck. It's really stable. So these are collectibles because they're, you know, they're old. Uh, here's a distributor rotor for a car engine. If you drive any kind of modern car, it does not have this. It has instead electronic ignition. Uh, but in the old days, this thing would go around to the distributor cap and it would connect the high voltage from the condenser coil in the car to a particular cylinder that needed to be fired at a certain point. So that rotor would go around and it would pick up that signal um, just going around and then carry that signal. Um, that the signal would be then connected uh, through the distributor cap and the spark plug wires uh, to the appropriate cylinder. So to do that, you're going to operate in an engine environment, and so it could be warm in there. And uh, so you, these stuff is pretty, pretty thermally stable. Okay. So they put all sorts of filler in them to make them, you know, to add uh, capacity and color and uh, thermal stability that if they need it. Um, so I, I recommend if you if you really like pushing these electrons around, um, you know, it's kind of a, some people find that enormously good fun. Um, uh, this is a fun video to watch, but like I say, 2x speed, it's hilarious. <clears throat> All right, now it's time to talk a little bit about the size and shape of polymers. This is material that's not in your book. Um, this is um, one of the chapters that's done reasonably well in the Aptec books would be size and shape, so you see polymer dimensions there. And I think that's the Aptec book. Chapter 6, I think. <clears throat> um, so far we've done through some other chapters uh, in that book. We just kind of hit little bits and pieces out of that. So I encourage you to go look at that. I think we've hit a little bit of Chapter 2 there. Um, probably 3 from molecular weight distribution and... Uh, Maybe even a little bit of four for viscosity, perhaps. Um, all right. And so you remember you find this on ran out of space. Applied Polymer Technology, all one word, appliedpolymertechnology.org. And so uh, those books, and then you go to uh, education. And from there, you go to virtual book. And the virtual book is really rough in some places, but the content of it is, is good. So I, I, you go ahead and have a look. It's way more material than you'll get in either Callister or um, Sanders, because the old metal guys just don't really care so much about polymers, I guess. But they're important. <clears throat> and so we're going to talk a little bit about... Um, okay, so I switched into... Um, OneNote, so I can show you a little bit about projections, and uh, this is kind of optional, but I think brushing up on your drawing skills is good for, for this class, and I, I really should do more of that myself. I'm going to draw the molecule chlorine, chlorine, hydrogen, hydrogen. This is a all atoms thing except for the carbons. I guess I could put the carbons in there too if I want. So that's a uh, 1, 2 dichloroethane. And that's what a projection of it would look like from the top. Um, actually, I would probably have been better off 
drawing that in a vertical direction. Why don't we just draw it in a vertical direction? That'll be easier. <clears throat> C, C, and we'll draw Cl, and we'll draw hydrogen, 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 and another Cl there. <clears throat> so that's a sort of a 2D projection of this thing. It's not very helpful to draw it that way. What I want to do is try to get us so we can draw that a little bit more in a, uh, a 3D kind of look, give that a 3D look. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a tripod. I think I would like this to be one heavier. Okay, so what I'm going to do so when I draw my tripods, I put uh, carbon, let's put uh, everything that we can into, uh, let's let that be a chlorine here, oops, okay. so let's make a chlorine there, a chlorine there, and all of those are in the plane of the screen, they're in the screen plane. And we know that the carbon to anything bonds um, for single bonds, <clears throat> for four single bonds, try to be 109.5, and it gives us that tetrahedral thing going on here. So this is a hydrogen that's coming out at me. And uh, there's a hydrogen that's going away from me. Can you see the tripod? There's a tripod there. Um, between there, that's a, like a plane between those. And I got to do the same thing. Let's draw the going backwards hydrogen first. Well, let's struggle more with those. And the uh, coming coming at you hydrogen last. So that's like a little tripod. It's like two tripods put together. It's sort of like a hat rack or something like that, see? <clears throat> now, if the chlorines are as far away as they can be in the representation that I've shown, uh, that's called a transconformation. OK? <clears throat> So I could draw that in other conformations. I could, I'll try to go a little faster, but I'm not good at speed here. Okay, so I could arrange this a little differently. I could say, okay, let's leave that chlorine there, hydrogen, hydrogen. Um, but now let's put the other chlorine in the back. And how would we physically do that? We would actually accomplish that uh, by rotating around this bond. <clears throat> okay, so we could just sort of rotate that one position. Okay. And uh, that would work. That would work. And uh, that we could have rotated the other way. Okay. I'm not going to draw that one, but you can imagine it could have rotated the other way. And that's slightly different um, confirmation. So there are really three different confirmations. There's trans, and one of those is called gauche plus, and the other is called gauche minus. Um, I think some other notations may be in use, okay, but that's basically the idea of it. So you have three different confirmations. So why am I telling you about dichloroethane? Well, I'm not really. I'm going to tell you about polymers. <clears throat> what if I decide instead of chlorines I'll, I'll, through all of this, I erase these chlorines. Erase the chlorines. And uh, instead of chlorine, I put something even bigger and bulkier, like a whole polymer chain. 
So what if all along, what if we only did that so that we could look at polymer chain. So this could have been, this carbon-carbon bond, could have been just a uh, one bond in the middle of some polymer, some giant polyethylene chain. Okay? And how that chain lays out is uh, uh, the subject. Um, I said when it was chlorines, it was easy to see that I could rotate three bonds. It's still possible to have three different choices for this. So suppose that every bond in that chain can have three different possible rotations. Okay, so each bond okay, uh, three three possible rotations, and doesn't get them. It has them. It inherited them. It always had them. You can go trans, you can go gauche plus, you can go gauche minus, each bond. <clears throat> so how many possible conformations are there for the whole chain? Okay. Um, okay, so if we have n bonds in the chain, then um, each of them has three possible rotations. So the total number we could define omega. Because we're leading up to entropy, and entropy always uses omega. Okay, so we'll define omega to be the total total, not tau, total number of conformations that are possible. So the total number of possible conformations, that's 3 to the n. Okay. Actually, it's probably 3 to the n minus 2 because it takes two bonds just to define a plane. <laughs> so you kind of have to have a starting point, and it takes two bonds to do that. But 3 to the n, 3 to the n plus 2, to n minus 2. Who could possibly care about that? How big a number is that? Well, we've said let's take a, poly, uh, let's take a polyethylene of molecular weight 100,000. Okay. <clears throat> um, there are actually a bond for every methylene group, two bonds per chain. Anyway, so we have n bond. Let's just say, I'll uh, just estimate this 100,000. Let's just say n could be 5,000. That's pretty big. Okay. But there are polymer chains with bigger n than that. What is 3 to the 5,000? A lot. Okay. <laughs> um, you could ask your calculator that. I don't happen to have mine handy right in the moment. Uh, but I think if I did, it would probably not be very happy about calculating that. It might. I don't know. Uh, the way we calculate that is uh, to say that say that omega is, let's just say, 3 to the 5,000. Okay. The way we calculate that is to say log 10 omega is 5,000 log 3. Log 3 is 0.5, it's actually 0.477, but close enough. Okay, uh, 2,500, close enough. So that means omega is 10 to the, 
2500. That's one big number. Okay. There are more confirmations in a medium sized polymer than there are seconds in the age of the universe. Okay. And if you don't believe me, you take whatever age of the universe, however old you think the universe is, I don't know what the latest estimate is, probably 10 billion years, let's say 10 billion years, okay? A of U, age of universe, <laughs> equals 10 to the 10th years. Okay? And as you know, there are about pi times 10 to the seventh seconds per year. So sort of on the order of 10 to the 17th. <coughs> seconds, all right? Not even close. Well, um, and nevertheless, um, we do know a little bit about the size of polymers, okay? And I'm going to tell you what we know. In principle, it's a pretty difficult situation. As you can see, there's an awful lot of confirmations. You pick whatever computer you have. The fastest quantum computer that anybody ever imagined isn't even going to touch that problem. So you have to use your head. And the guy that did this first was Paul Flory. And we'll show you some arguments that actually sort of predate him, but he actually was able to make computations of these things in a sensible way, with some assumptions, of course. But even enumerating the confirmations, even if you told your computer to count a billion of them per second, you wouldn't even come close to counting that many confirmations. So it's a big problem. And the problem basically rolls around this. Here's a polymer. We're going to draw polymers this way. Uh, you don't have to draw yours exactly the same way I draw mine. I hope you're drawing something, though. <clears throat> okay, so each of those could be a carbon atom or whatever you want it to be. And we'll say that each bond is a length L for the bond. And uh, each of the beads, each of the carbon atoms, we'll say that this is a... Um, we'll say that it's a 2b. It's either going to be 2b or not to be. Small joke, very small joke. So there's a bead radius b length l. Okay, that's fine. That's our model of a polymer, and that's a small one with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So that's, you know, a really small polymer. And by the way, small polymers are called oligomers. Oligo means a few. So a few, a few mers, a few parts. How would we decide the size of that thing? It's an irregularly shaped thing, and it's we've sort of taken a snapshot of it in one confirmation. Microseconds later, it's going to look totally different. Uh, it could sort of try to lay out, you know, as we've discussed. Okay, so that's a different confirmation. So it's rapidly interchanging among those um, confirmations. In this case, it looks like we would have four, 15 beads, 14 bonds, subtract 2, 
12, 2 to the, 3 to the 12th, whatever 3 to the 12th is, uh, a million possible confirmations for this guy. Okay, something on the order of a million possible confirmations for this guy. And it's rapidly interchanging among them. Um, uh, but even if we just took a snapshot at one instance in time, it's going to be exceedingly difficult to say what its size is, even to define what that means. What does that even mean? What does the size even mean? So, you know, people had to do something. And so what they, they came up with was they say, okay, well, we, one thing we could do, we could, we could try this, this could work. We could, um, we could take the distance from the chain ends. We could call that H. You know what? H is as good as anything else. I guess we'll leave it at H. <coughs> um, there are different things that people go uh, with for this one. They maybe maybe I'll put down R E E. Okay. <coughs> H, also known as R E E. Okay. Uh, because this thing is flopping around like mad, the average of R E E. Uh, it's a let's make it be a vector. From the end to the, let's make it be a vector. It's a little easier to do if it's a, if it's a vector. Okay, so it's a vector from one end to the other. We make we'll underline it to indicate it's a vector. Because the thing is flopping around so massively, the average of that vector is zero. Okay. Sometimes it points like it is now, which is northwest. Uh, sometimes it could point southeast. Sometimes it could point in other directions and point in all sorts of different directions. So on average, it's just zero. This should be, getting, be starting to look a little bit like the diffusion problem that we looked at. These problems are, have a formal similarity. That's one dimension that we could define. And R on that, it's useless to mention because it's zero. Okay, so uh, so we could we could cross that out as being useless. What would be useful would be R squared e. e. Okay, that would be useful. Only the problem is it's more like a units of an area. So if we really wanted to be a dimension, we should take the square root. Okay, so this uh, is called the RMS end-to-end -end distance. Root mean square end to end distance. Okay. <clears throat> and people have different notations for that, but probably the best thing is just to leave it as it is, you know, <laughs> just leave it like that, square root like it is, okay? That is only one of our choices, though, okay? It turns out that one is pretty hard to measure in real polymers because they flop around too much and they're sort of difficult to see where the ends are. There are experiments that can get you that but they are not very easily applied and only to a few polymers. All right, so what I'm going to do, if, uh, if I'll be allowed to do it, is Cut all that out. And shrink it. I cut everything but the little end here. It looks like I missed that guy. Ah, now I gotta start off. 
Let's try again. This time I'll be more careful to catch that. And uh, we'll shrink this guy down. Let's do it a different way. It's being difficult. Let's capture the molecule itself. There it is. Same molecule. I just moved it. Okay, same molecule, same confirmation, instantaneous confirmation. It will not look like this for very long, as we keep saying. All right. And actually, it will be convenient to make it be a little bigger. <clears throat> so let's uh, let's define a different size because it's actually an important and practically used size. Another way we could try to define size is to figure out where the center of mass of the beast is. Now, this is in two dimensions. It's actually in three, but anyway, we'll say it's two mass. I don't know where the center of mass of that would be. Probably, I'm going to guess sort of about here, where I'm drawing. Oh, yeah? One note. What can you say? I'll say this is about the center of mass. Right? And so from the center of mass, we can work our way from the center of mass and define the position of every bead relative to the center of mass. Let's say the center of mass is the origin. That's bead number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's bead eight. Okay? So this is S8. Okay? S sub eight. And you can try to draw some of the other S's if you want, okay? But you get the basic idea of it. The mass, um, there's a mass defined in this way. Uh, each of these beads, we will say, has a mass. This is bead 9, so this is mass M9. Okay? So in that kind of notation, we can define a, um, a radius from the center of mass. Uh, this way. We can take m1 s1 squared plus m2 s2 squared plus, and it continues like this. And I think we said we had 14 of these. Hopefully they still are. One, two, 15. Somewhat more simply, we can use a sum notation. We can use a notation involving sums to write this as the sum from the first bead, i equal 1, to the nth bead, okay, where n is now the number of beads, not the number of bonds, <coughs> of m sub i s sub i squared over the sum of m i. 
So that uh, would be a, it would be a, a wonderful dimension of size. Uh, it would be a wonderful size, except for one little problem, which is that it's got the wrong dimensions. And it has to, we have to take the square root to fix that. Okay, so that's the center of mass radius. It also, naturally, because it's polymers and material science in general, it has to have an alternative name. RG. And the G stands for gyration. This model has nothing to do with gyration. We are not imagining. Do not confuse this as the moment of inertia, radius of inertia, okay? It's not that. Gyration would be spinning this whole molecule like that. No, okay? This is an accident. of translation. Okay. And uh, unlike other accidents, uh, this one has a, a translation or sort of other scientific misfortunate things like the SI system, for example. Uh, this one goes back to France. So um, we don't want to blame them for this. I don't know who made the, who muffed the translation, but anyway, it has nothing to do with the molecule spinning about, forget that. You will hear that all the time. This will be called radius of gyration. Much safer to call it radius of center of mass, but do not expect that to ever change. Okay, that's never changing. All right, so there are two sizes that we can, two ways that we can at least size polymers. Okay. Now, uh, this whole series of videos, and these, we've been in this thing, um, uh, we've been calling this, all of this has been about um, I've called all of this chapter 2.6 and I really should have called it kind of more like Harry Potter, right? Two and three fifths. Because 0.6, which is the fraction two fifths, is a special number. Because guess what? <clears throat> For many polymers under many conditions, It turns out that, what do I have to do to get this thing to behave? I'm going to go ahead and call it RG just because people do. It is proportional to mass, the molecular weight, to the three-fifths power. Okay. In a polymer melt, more like one half. And there is a formal relationship between this kind of behavior um, and diffusion. And that's more easily seen from the kind of mean square end to end relationship.
So uh, these are um, laws that uh, look a little bit um, like diffusion. If I was to look at the diffusion equation, I would say x squared is proportional. Let's just take 2 diffusion times t. Let's take the square root of x squared. Okay, so whether you're charting out um, where the one end of a chain is compared to the other, or whether you're charting out where a molecule starts diffusing and ends up, it's basically the same kind of problem. Okay, so this whole polymer dimension thing is an example of a random walk problem. So I have a friend who is a physicist, a by God card-carrying member of the APS Physical Society. I guess I'm also that, but I'm not trained as a physicist like he is. And he says all problems in physics are either a random walk problem or a driven-damped harmonic oscillator. And if that's true of physics, it's probably true of much engineering. So either random walk or harmonic oscillator, and you've pretty much got it all covered. So it's important to see the common threads in uh, these matters. Okay, so we're back. I've clipped that and put it into uh, PowerPoint. And uh, hopefully you can do the same, put your own in the PowerPoint. <clears throat> okay, the other thing I wanted to mention is that this is a uh, example of a scaling law this relationship between size and mass. Uh, we deal in soft materials with all sorts of other scaling laws. And um, I'm going to flip back into OneNote and just uh, invert this for you a little bit to see if uh, we can have some more fun with this. I think we will see a connection to some very co common and uh, valuable concepts here. Okay, so we said we said the radius That radius is uh, proportional to m to the three fifths. I could uh, write that the other way around. Okay, I could raise everything to the five thirds power, and then I would have r to the five thirds on the left is m to the one. Okay, I'll just write m. Right? And that leads us to the thought of a kind of object where the mass doesn't go up as it does for the objects that we're most familiar with. Imagine just for a moment a solid ball. Let's say it's a, a BB. If you had a BB gun or if you didn't have a BB gun, it could be a, could be a baseball that baseballs all have the same size. So let's suppose we have some sort of solid ball, a ball bearing or whatever you have, <clears throat> and we say it has mass m and uh, size, uh, diameter,
uh, 2 r okay twice the radius if I draw one that's twice as big so I've increased the radius so now my diameter has gone from 2r to 4r okay I'm sorry, I want to use the same R all the way across. 4R. So if the radius of the first one was 2R, the radius of this one is then 4R. And its mass is 8 times as much. Okay? So for a solid object like this, for a solid object, mass goes as radius, say, well, let's say let's do diameter. This goes as diameter. Cubed. And that's what solids do. If it was instead a ping pong ball, and I don't know what's twice as big as a ping pong ball, could be a bubble. Okay, ping pong balls are empty. It could be a bubble. Okay, so this is a, a not a solid object, this is a hollow object. We then find that mass goes as diameter squared. But our polymer went as diameter to the 5 thirds. Okay? So um, there's a thing called the Hausdorff dimension. The Hausdorff dimension says uh, it goes, it's whatever goes into this. Okay. DF. Okay. Mass is proportional to size to DF. So for polymers, And remember I said that one was in a good solvent. DF is 5 thirds, 1.7. Now, the Hausdorff dimension isn't the only name that's given to this dimension. It's often called the fractal dimension. Okay, so it's a fractal dimension, and polymers are fractal objects because they have non-integer Hausdorff dimensions. They have non-integer dimensions here. Often they do. Not always. They often do. I'll give you a couple others just to contemplate. What if we had a thin rod? So thin. So thin. It's just an infinitely thin rod. This has Hausdorff dimension of 1. That's as low as we know how to go. Okay? Um, <clears throat> turns out that if we aggregate a lot of particles together, this happens all the time in various forms of soft matter, and it's very important even in making of ultralight glass. Okay, uh, these have fractal dimensions, oh, sort of around two. Let's say one point, probably goes a little lower to 2.3. Okay, and so this Hausdorff dimension is really telling you how dense the object is. Okay, the lowest it can be is one. That's a thin object. It's not dense. Okay, 
the most it can be is three. That's a solid object. So this Hausdorff dimension um, tells us about the uh, density of the object. And that's very valuable because we can't actually always go in and measure that. The objects are too soft. How would you measure the density of a dandelion <clears throat> of the flower to a dandelion? It's a very soft object. Okay, so uh, that's uh, a little bit about how soft dimensions. And I covered defined radius. I did them. I didn't tell you how we measure these sizes, but we can measure them. And I will tell you about this exceedingly briefly. Okay. I think I can get away with doing this. In a uh, PowerPoint. We'll see. Suppose I have an object. Here's an object. It could be a solid, it could be whatever, it could be a polymer, but right now it's just an object. And uh, light rays are going to be shined on this object from a laser. Okay? And uh, as a result of that, uh, most of that light goes straight through, by the way. It's just most of it, 99.999% goes straight through. But a certain amount of the light gets scattered. And if it gets scattered over to the detector, here's a detector. Okay, there's a detector. Uh, it turns out that if the light comes in in phase like this, it may arrive at the detector out of phase depends on okay so we had this slide uh, very briefly earlier on when we talked about getting molecular weights but I didn't really spend much time with it it can arrive at the detector out of phase if object is big enough or wavelength small enough um, and uh, the angle theta is not equal to zero. So this is the angle theta. So you have to rotate the detector. This is a detector. I drew an eyeball. Eyeball is a, one possible choice for a detector. So if the light arrives out of phase, the intensity will go down. So in generally, the scattered light intensity goes down. If I do a plot, of intensity versus theta. I could measure this at several points. And if I measure a medium-sized molecule, I'll get that. If I measure a really tiny molecule, uh, well, probably the scattering would be less, but mostly it would be really flat. Okay. So that's small. That's medium. And huge can be a problem. Huge could do this. It can actually bounce up and down a little bit in here. OK, so this is huge. And uh, my machine might not measure low enough to see huge, okay? <laughs> so this might be the instrument uh, 
instrument cutoff. So then I'd have to make an instrument that can measure, rotate the detector down to lower angle. There are technical problems with why you can't go too low. So this is um, not defined radius. This is this is how get size these sizes. This is one way to get the sizes. Uh, and this is called static light scatter. And it gives you that radius RG. I think I used a small g earlier. OK, so that's where RG values would come from. They would come from an experiment like that. Now, a lot of times <clears throat> this is done in uh, polymer solutions, but if you wanted to get the size of an object in a polymer melt, we know how to do that too. Uh, it involves labeling one of the polymers with neutrons <clears throat> or in some other way, and then maybe using labeling the polymer molecules with uh, extra neutrons, and then we do a neutron scattering experiment. And there are certain x-ray scattering experiments that you can do that do that as well. I want to um, just tell you very briefly um, about Brownian motion. And this is another kind of light scattering that we know how to do. And uh, we need to know this for Brownian motion. We need to know it for diffusion. And so this is a picture uh, in a microscope of some particles. Uh, they were polymers or particles of some pretty big size. I'm pretty sure these are big. And uh, I'm going to play the video, and you will see what they do. I hope. Here it goes. OK. You see they're moving around. They're moving randomly. They seem to be moving in a random way. And you see the really bright ones. I guess I could play it again. But if you look carefully, you'll see some that aren't quite as bright. They may be smaller or maybe not quite in the correct focal plane of the, of the system. So this is Brownian random motion. This is what diffusion really is. Okay, This is your first introduction to actually seeing diffusion. I mentioned it earlier before. Uh, but now you can see it. And this kind of diffusion happens. This is actually particles in a fluid. Um, but it happens even in metals. There's a diffusion in metals. There's a diffusion in many things. It happens in melts. And understanding diffusion is a very important thing in, in material science, uh, including the polymer end of it. I, I actually think it might be just as important, if not more so, to the uh, metals people. <coughs> And I'm just going to tell you, because we really haven't got time to, to, to get into this, that there's a thing called dynamic light scattering. And it gives you another radius, as if we didn't have enough sizes already. It gives you a thing called RH. H stands for hydrodynamic. Okay. And the relationship is, and you have it in your problem set, which is why I'm telling you this, the relationship is that the diffusion coefficient, D, is K Boltzmann times temperature over 6 pi viscosity naught hydrodynamic radius. OK, so some of the problems that you're working on um, in the current set uh, involve that relationship, and you can solve that. Mm -hmm. I want to make an interesting point here. The usual thing to do is to you know, measure D using dynamic light scattering, which Georgia Tech has a lot of. Yes, sir. 
really seven super competent instruments within 500 feet of my office. Uh, not all of them are mine. Most, well, the best ones are mine. Um, then uh, measure D using DLS and solve for RH. Um, and to do that, you have to know the viscosity. Okay, so I should set up what these terms are here. KB is Boltzmann's constant. My favorite form of it is in CGS units. You do whatever you think you need to do. Um, gram centimeter squared per second squared Kelvin. Okay. <clears throat> the uh, T is uh, Kelvin temperature. Uh, A to zero is solvent viscosity. We've seen A to be solvent viscosity. Uh, we've seen A to be viscosity, now it's the zero means solvent viscosity. And that's all you need. Um, so you could do that. The other thing that's an interesting experiment to contemplate, and people have done this, is to know the hydrodynamic radius and measure D. So mode one here is measure D, solve for RH. Mode two would be measure D. We're always going to measure D by DLS. Um, and solve for viscosity. Uh, some known RH. And this thing goes as a thing called probe diffusion. And it's an interesting thing to consider because what it means is that if you could monitor the motion of some particle probe in a fluid, that's an efficient way to get its viscosity. And in fact, the fluid doesn't have to be the usual kind of fluid that you pour into a beaker. It could be in some tiny little capsule. What if you wanted to know the viscosity inside of a gel cap? We want to know the viscosity inside of a, uh, a capsule that's so small you can barely see it. Well, this is a way to measure that. So that's an interesting material science type uh, consideration too. Okay, so we're going to stop at this point and uh, come back to it a little later.